is turned between two centers. This is to make sure that both of the holes are dead center in the barrel. The nuts and bolts I'm adding to the other side of the plate are being used for counterweight, just so the lathe won't vibrate so much. Before jaw chuck is installed, then the barrel is flipped over and the bore is indicated in. The barrel is then turned to size and threaded. I'm now testing the fit. Now I take the width of the frame and the distance between the frame and the cylinder. And then I take a few file off for clearance, and this is how long I cut the threaded portion of the barrel. Then I test the fit with the gap gauge. Everybody and their mother argues to how much gap you need in between the cylinder and the barrel. I left four thou. If you're going to be shooting a gun a lot and have a bunch of fouling, then you might want to leave more. In general, most people say between four and ten thousand. All revolvers have a small cone that's cut into the threaded side of the barrel. I took the bulk of the material out with a chamfering cutter and then did the rest by hand. The cone is there just in case there's any misalignment between the cylinder and the barrel. If there is any misalignment, the cone will help guide the bullet across the gap. 
Now a piece of brass rod is faced off and center drilled. Then it is turned to size. One of the problems that I discovered with this setup is that I'm going to have to push the cutter through the barrel instead of pull it through the cutter because I can't, don't have access to the back of a short barrel. On a rifle barrel this wouldn't be a problem because the barrel will go all the way through the other end of the spindle. Because of this I machined a step in the brass rod. This will basically give me a carriage stop. When the cutter comes out the other side of the barrel, part of the cutter is still inside of the barrel which keeps it from falling out. I lap them both together so it's a perfect fit. The brass rod is then removed and three flats are machined into the opposite end. This will prevent the rod from accidentally spinning in the chuck. A piece of O1 tool steel is turned down to size. This will actually become two different things. A gauge and the cutter. Two flats are milled into each side of it so it is an eighth of an inch thick. Two tie down blocks with an adjustable parallel are used to support the center of it because it is so thin. The front half is cut off, this will become the cutter.
the bottom third is milled off. The part is then flipped over, and a slot is milled into it. There's a small shim under one side, this gives it a little bit of an angle. This small angle will be the cutting edge. There is a relief cut into the back side of the cutter. As the cutter rotates, if that clearance wasn't there, it would run into the groove itself. The part is then hardened. An eighth inch slot is milled into the brass rod. This is where the cutter will rest. If you just saw the cutter try to fall out of the rod, this is the exact reason I milled the step into the brass rod. The cutter never fully comes out of the inside of the bore. Since I'll have no access to the back side of it, this will keep it from falling out. The cutter just sits inside the slot. After each of the six grooves are cut, there's a piece of paper placed underneath the cutter, and then the six grooves are cut again. This will be repeated until the desired dimension is reached. This will be the gauge to measure the bore. The gauge is made to the finished size of the rifling grooves. This type of gauge will only work if you have even numbers of rifling grooves. If you had, let's say, a five grooved barrel, you could not use this gauge. You'd have to use a different method to measure. The gauge is placed into two corresponding rifling grooves. The picture is a little misleading. The gauge is actually placed in at an angle. Once you have reached the desired dimension, you will be able to rock it from top to bottom all the way. There will be just a little bit of resistance. 
If the bore diameter is not to size, it will lock up and not allow you to do this. I'm placing a small piece of paper into the groove to raise up the cutter. Put a couple of C clamps on the back side so I have something to use as a stop. This is repeated for each of the indexing marks. For me, this is more of a proof of concept just to make sure it worked. After doing this, I figured out that I'm going to actually cut the rifling attachment up and then I'm going to rearrange it a little bit. By doing this, I should be able to use the carriage to power it and also be able to do left and right hand grooves. I'm also going to make a proper cutter. The cutter that I made here, like I said, was sort of proof of concept. This style cutter is the type of cutter they used to do muskets with. A modern cutter would have a hinge and a ramp built into it so you don't have to use the little paper shems. You can also control the depth of cut much better that way. Cutting the barrel took me about an hour. I didn't show the whole thing because it was just the same process repeated over and over and over. Overall, the rifling came out really well. Down in the grooves it's a little rough, so I think I'm going to lead lap it and try to smooth it out a little bit. I have an old Mauser 98 that has rifling that's worse than this and it shoots fine, so We'll see how it goes. Overall though, I would say it wasn't too bad for rifling my first barrel. That's all for this week. Please like, subscribe, and comment.